30. Thanks for being here for our new series this academic year. We're in the grand rounds and the distinguished visiting lecture series starts at 8.30, not 8 o'clock, and we want to be prompt with that. The problem is that with this new format, there are exactly 60 seconds for introductions. So I'll have to be very brief. Really pleased to introduce Dr. Rosalind Picard, Professor of Media, Sciences, and Arts at MIT, as well as founder and director of the Affective Computing Research Group at MIT. I am not positive, but I believe this is the first time in the history of Grand Rounds at UCSF Psychiatry that an electrical engineer will be introducing us. She's also co-founder of Affectiva and Empatica startups in this domain. As her Wikipedia page attests in her website, she's credited with starting the branch of computer science known as affective computing. In short, she's a pioneer in linking emotion and intelligence and the essential role of affective processes as computing and AI continue their vast growth. A few of us had the privilege and pleasure of having dinner with her last night. I'll add to my 60 seconds by saying her compassion, sheer intelligence, vision, entrepreneurship, and thinking deeply about what computing is evolving into, I think is gonna to lead to a great talk today. So please welcome Dr. Rosalind Picard. Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. As we um, think about the future of AI, I, I know people are often talking about the robots we're building and they're going to obsolete us, but the, the future I see needs the people in this room more than ever. So I welcome you to make this, um, he said, stop the conversation. I make, hope this will be the beginning of a deeper conversation that we need to have uh, together. I need to mention some disclosures. In addition to co-founding Affectiva and Empatica, where I'm a shareholder, I have received funding from the organizations here in the last year as well. All right, I think the inventory mic is on. Yep. I'm gonna tell some stories while I introduce the technology. And the first one starts with our work to build computers that had social emotional intelligence. And one day, a young man came in my office and he said, um, you know, maybe what you're doing could help my brother. And he started telling me about his brother with autism. And as I started to work more and more with people on the autism spectrum, I went in to help them with this attitude that, oh, you know, I've, I've read these hundred papers about you know, how you have difficulty understanding other people's emotions and so forth. And we were building technology that could not only help machines understand our emotions, but could be worn in a way that a person who had difficulty, say, reading with these facial expressions, little camera, you know, could, could read it and say, yes, she's smiling and nodding. Uh, and that was helpful to many of these individuals. But one day, in that wonderful way that um, people on the spectrum have of being super honest, one of them said to me, Roz, you have it all wrong. Uh, my biggest problem is not understanding other people's emotions, my biggest problem is you're not understanding my emotions. And I thought, great, I'm an engineer. <laughs> We're not, we have a long way to improve on that. Um, uh, what is it that I'm not understanding? And interestingly, sensing my awkwardness, showing lots of theory of mind, which supposedly uh, people in the spectrum couldn't do, but so many of them can do perfectly fine. Um, she says, it's not just you. It's everybody's not understanding my emotions, not understanding our emotions. We are so often misread. And I said, well, what are we misreading? And she said, you're not getting the huge anxiety and stress that so many of us are feeling. So I, I grabbed this picture. Here's a boy who looks pretty stressed, right, holding on to mom's leg. Um, but what we were often seeing is a person who looked pretty calm, like everybody sitting here looks right now and sometimes even laying on the floor, looking like they're just being kind of lazy in the middle of a classroom or something. Uh, and the teacher's like, you know, Johnny's being unproductive, you know, like, get back to your desk, get working. And suddenly Johnny erupts and gets injurious, maybe to himself or to others. And they say, where did that come from? Why did somebody go from zero to 60 with no outward signs? I say, you know, we've been building this technology that could 
uh, take the physiology and get it um, in a way that could be, become outwardly visible. Maybe there would be something there that would be uh, useful for helping communicate this stress, uh, this anxiety. Uh, you guys are experts on the physiology. This is just one of many um, pictures of the autonomic nervous systems, two main branches. There's a third branch, the enteric nervous system, that's also incredibly interesting that we're starting to do some work on now. But the best known, of course, in a vastly oversimplified way here from Sapolsky's book, is the fight or flight response, the sympathetic, or the rest and digest, the parasympathetic. Uh, I like this picture because it shows how many parts of the body are connected to this. I'm going to talk uh, mostly about one part that's not shown here the largest organ, the skin, uh, which is uh, understood to receive uh, the sympathetic nervous system innervation without parasympathetic influence, unlike the heart, which gets both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So we wanted to measure this uh, sympathetic stress. And traditionally, this is done by saying, hey, you know, people get stressed, um, fight or flight response, their palms get sweaty. and we can just measure little changes in conductance or resistance on the skin, and the conductance goes up if your palms sweat, so that should be indicative of uh, this uh, um, electrodermal response reflecting this sympathetic innervation. This, how many people here, I you know Wendy's used this a lot, how many other people here have worked with electrodermal activity? All right, so about a third to a half here. So you're familiar with these classic ways of doing this. We started to say, gee, you know, if I'm going to measure a kid all day long at school, the hands kind of like need to be washed, the wires get in the way. So we started exploring if this would work in other locations. Initially thinking this is just a general arousal response. Maybe we can pick it up with some sweat glands in other places, even though there's different kinds of sweat glands and maybe some are more related to sympathetic activation and some more related to just thermoregulation. That was the oversimplified thinking at the time. We have since learned that the position of these is much more interesting than that classic view. Uh, today I'm involved with Empatica who has commercialized these sensors uh, from our lab in an ambulatory fashion. At the top is the um, Embrace uh, smartwatch, first smartwatch recently approved by the FDA and for use in neurology. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And the E4 on the bottom here measuring the electrodermal activity, um, photoplethysmography for blood volume pulse and heart rate and heart rate variability on my wrist uh, and movement. Um, and it has detachable electrodes so you can run the leads to other dermatones too if you get interested in exploring the differences that we are finding in different parts of the body. Here's an example of the first time we were measuring electrodermal activity here on the legs of a girl who is undergoing occupational therapy. The stuff on her head you can ignore, that was something else, but you could see two little black sweatbands around her ankles. And as she gets on the swing, it illustrates a few things here that can cause the level to go up. So I, I want to be clear, this isn't simply a stress response. There are at least three kinds of activity that we know can give rise to this increase in skin conductance that, that we just saw as she got on the swing here. One is an anticipatory response, uh, one um, that can be very affective, it can be excitement, uh, it can also be stress. The second, so it's kind of an affective response. The second is a cognitive response. For many individuals, the motor planning required to get on this thing is actually a lot of effort. I've seen some people who sort of Parkinsonian who have difficulty moving something and you can see even before they move the signal peaking as they're making the, con the effort to do this motor activity. Uh, also there is, um, so there's the affective, the cognitive and the physical. Physical exertion of course will um, make this go up too. Here we're seeing it from her left and right ankle. In the beginning we would just measure the two sides thinking they were the same and that the only thing that would be different was noise. Uh, here we were ignoring the differences. Now we're starting to pay much more close attention to the differences for some reasons I'll, I'll show you. This is uh, seven days of data, 24 hours a day, from uh, the wrist of a, the first time we had a wrist recording electrodermal device. And this is an MIT student. Uh, what we see 
first of all, recognizing that cognitive load and mental effort makes this go up. It's no surprise that we see it go up here with lab activity in the upper left uh, and with MIT exams and studying uh, and homeworks, which are notoriously hard. Uh, think of you guys doing that hard learning for your medical exams or something. Um, and then, unfortunately, to the embarrassment of we MIT professors <laughs> over here on the right, um, the low point everyday classroom activity. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Laughter actually makes the audience's lectodermal activity go up. So does live Q&A, uh, and um, so do live demos, um, anticipatory responses. Now, another thing that was, so that was actually not surprising to me. Uh, I've done a lot of measurement in classrooms trying to figure out how to get that signal up. Uh, what was surprising to me was that the biggest peak of the day for most people was during sleep. How many of you kn knew about EDA going up during sleep? Ah, there, oh wow, wow, half dozen, that's great. Um, classically measured on the palm, it goes down during sleep, but on the wrist, it's boosted during sleep. Still a bit mysterious why that is. If you zoom in on them, on this fuzzy stuff here, these are actually high frequency patterns for electrodermal activity, high frequency. And um, as you zoom in, whether it's on the palm or the wrist, they're correlated and they are most likely to happen during non-REM sleep, specifically during the latter part of non-REM sleep. Uh, so these decays are usually REM and these peaking are non-REM. So we thought, what is this? This person just getting really sweaty, thermal regulation turning off during sleep. We started looking at all those things. We added a temperature sensor. It's not correlated with temperature. I mean, it is in a big way, right? If you go into a super hot uh, you know, taxi cab and you start sweating, yes, it goes up. But generally, if you look across the day and look to explain these with temperature, it's not, uh, doesn't explain most of it. So what is it? Well, still a bit of a mystery. Uh, we're very interested now in um, some single darn hippocampal recordings and other things that seem to be having the same statistics as this. But this is a robust effect. While this is one person's data here, this is a general effect across uh, everybody that we measure. So I can say more about that later, but I'm going to switch and tell you another story which completely changed the direction we were working on. I know the talk is about mood, stress, health. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a detour and then come back to it. And this is an important detour because this one led us to connect up a lot of the neurology with the psychiatry. I don't know if we have any neurologists here. Uh, no, but oh, one. Okay. So we had built sweatbands like this that could log your skin conductance, movement, temperature 24 7. And it was the end of the fall semester. And one of the undergrads in my lab knocks on my door and he says, Professor Ricard, could I borrow uh, one of your wristband sensors? My little brother has autism, he can't talk, and I want to see what's stressing him out over winter break. And I said, sure. In fact, don't just take one. Take, take two, because they broke all the time back then. I figured he'd use one over break, then he'd put on a second one. So he puts, actually, the two on his little brother at the same time. And I'm back in my office in MIT looking at the data. Uh, and I see the two wrist streams of data going for day one, and they're pretty low, and I think, wow, this kid maybe has ADHD, which tends to correspond to very low electrodermal activity. Um, very low, very low. Certainly didn't look like he had much stressors going on. Next day, same thing. I'm zooming in, making sure that there's the kind of responses that show us that it's working properly. Next day, same thing, gone. Next day, my jaw drops. One of the wristband electrodermal activity responses was so high that I thought it must be broken. We have stressed people out at MIT every way we could think of. Some of you have probably done that here too. Uh, everything from qualifying exams to Boston driver stress to loud noises in your ear to you know, a long list of things. And I had never seen a response so high. And weirder, it was on one wrist and not the other. Now, the neurologist in the room could tell us this, but at the time I could not figure out how could one side be stressed and not the other? How could arousal be happening on one wrist and not the other wrist? Uh, so I thought one or both of the bands must be broken. Uh, I'll spare you all the debugging I did. Suffice it to say it didn't explain it. I gave up and I called the student at home on vacation. This took a little courage for me as a professor to bother my student at home on vacation. Hi, uh, 
how's your Christmas? How's your little brother? Um, hey, do you have any idea what happened to him? And I gave the exact date and time and the data. And he said, I don't know, I'll go check the diary. I'm like, diary? The student keeps a diary. <laughs> like, how good is this? You know? um, and I wait, and he comes back, and he has the exact date and time written down. And he says, that was right before he had a grand mal seizure. Now, I knew very little about those, started doing research on that. And next thing I know, I'm on the phone with the chief of nurse surgery at Children's Hospital Boston, Dr. Madison. Hi, Dr. Madison, my name's Rosalind Picard. Do you, do you know if it's possible for somebody to have a huge sympathetic nervous system surge? In this case, it looked like it was 20 minutes before the seizure. I said 20 minutes before the seizure. And he said, um, uh, probably not. Uh, he says, it's interesting, we've had patients whose hair stands on it on one arm 20 minutes before a seizure. And I'm like, on one arm? <laughs> you know, I kind of didn't want to tell him that part because I still couldn't believe this. Well, he got very excited about that. And I showed him the data, we got um, safety certified RV approval, made a bunch of more devices, uh, all kinds of cute little sweatbands and patterns. Um, Children's Hospital Boston ran a study with uh, 90 children that were all candidates for brain surgery. They essentially, in most of our work, we just add our sensors into an existing study. It's very easy, they're non-invasive. And uh, what we found in 100% of that first batch of grand mal seizures was every one of the seizures had a uh, significant skin conductance response. More than Significant was defined as more than two standard deviations above the pre-seizure period. So here what you see, uh, remember how sleep was usually the biggest peak of the day? Here's 24 hours for a teenager. Here's the boy's sleep, uh, which is, would usually be his biggest peak of the day. All the stuff we usually measure related to stress and emotion is down here in the ground cover. And these are like your gorgeous California redwoods popping out uh, of this graph. These are three generalized tonic-clonic seizures, also known as grand mal seizures. Now the top is the electrodermal activity, higher um, here is measured as skin conductance. So higher is more conductive. We think of it as more sweat. And um, we thought naively of it as more sweat. It turns out the signal can go up quite a bit even when you don't feel sweaty. And again, this was on the wrist, not the palm. Uh, and here we also see the accelerometer activity. I thought, not just why is it so big, but why is it so big so long? I mean, this is a whopper of a skin conductance response lasting more than a half hour here. And furthermore, there, there's not a lot of activity here if you zoom in on this. In fact, usually after a seizure, the seizure's only a, a couple of minutes wide here, um, the convulsive part, uh, but there's something going on much longer here. Like, what is this? You know, is the person smacking the thing against something? Are they rounded out? Well, so we had gold standard ECG electrodermal activity now, before it was a gold standard, um, um, video and EEG. We go through that and we find that there's something quite surprising. Oh, actually, I'll just mention, it's kind of important, um, that if you're, if you're just trying to detect a seizure with a shaky watch uh, movement detector, you get this data down here, which as you can imagine has a huge number of false alarms. When you combine this with this, you get not only a, a sensitive but also a more specific seizure detector. So Ingzer Poe, as part of his PhD, published this uh, in epilepsy. Since then, in Patagon, has commercialized this, um, and here's a longer multi-site study that was used as part of uh, FDA clearance for uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure detection using these two signals instead of um, just either one. Okay, but back to the science about why is it so big? Now, one of the things we learned is that there is, uh, there's a thing called SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, and I'm curious in this super well-educated audience. I bet a lot of you still haven't heard of this. How, how many of you had never heard of SUDEP until I said it here now? Most of you. All right, I'm glad we're changing this today. I'll tell you a few more things about it. Uh, so SUDEP is when a person who has a diagnosis of epilepsy dies uh, and they cannot attribute the death to hitting their head, drowning, um, heart problems, anything else, okay? And, Officially, an autopsy confirms there's no signs of anything that could have caused this. In all of the observed cases of SUDEP that are written up in the literature where the person happened to be wearing an EEG when they had this, when they died, um, there was, a, uh, actually now there's a couple cases where there wasn't an obvious seizure before, but in um, all of these ones uh, that have looked at PGES 
uh, post postictal. Here's the seizure. These are the EEG traces, so they're all kind of going crazy here during the seizure. Here, the seizure stops, and now instead of going back to normal brainwave activity, they're all below 10 microvolts. So this is called postictal after the seizure, generalized across all the EEG channels suppression (PGES). The duration of this in some studies of people. Um, when you went back and looked at the characteristics of their seizures, was a significant predictor of whether they later died of SUDEP or not. And then during actual SUDEPs, if the person died while they were wearing an EEG, this was present in 100% of the cases, um, with or without an obvious seizure beforehand. This was always observed. So we're like, what is this? It looks like your brain is sort of going crazy during the seizure, then it's over, maybe it's trying to shut off the seizure, so it shuts off your whole brain. Well, if it's shutting off your whole brain, how then could we be getting the following? And this was from our first set of data. It's now been replicated with a larger group. We were getting the longer the shutdown of the scalp electrode brain activity, the bigger the response on the wrist. And that was whether we measured it with amplitude or area under the curve. Uh, and this was an initial pediatric cohort written up in neurology. Um, since then, it's been replicated with an adult co cohort in larger groups. So why would something here, like lack of brain activity, correspond to, and the longer that that's going on, correspond to bigger signal on the wrist. Well, our best thinking on this right now uh, is that what, what's sending the suppressed signal to the cortex is actually unusual brain activity deep in the brain that can shut down the cortex. And that when that activity is happening, it's also stimulating the electrodermal response. So that's our current thinking on that. Subject to future revision, lots of measurements going on right now. Now, let me tell you some things that start to relate this back to psychiatry and emotion. Uh, you know, we know, we've all had the experience where something takes our breath away, right? Um, well, most of us have not had the following experience, which is where you have a craniotomy, so your skull is open, and they're willing to go in, and while they're in there, they're going to stimulate your amygdala, right or left, either side, whether or not you have epilepsy. It was shown uh, in this work that the person felt no pain, they could be fully conscious and awake doing their email, but they stopped breathing. It's not that they can't breathe, it's that they don't breathe. Brainstem breathing function is still there. As soon as you say their name, you know, Steve, are you okay? Steve goes, yes, he takes a breath and he says, I'm fine. So the act of going in and stimulating the amygdala uh, seems in a certain way can turn off your breathing. It's also the case that touching the person or saying their name can restart the breathing. Uh, so either amygdala, it was also shown that when a seizure automatically spread to this, it turned off the person's breathing. It was also shown in all of the cases of uh, SUDEP, sudden unexpected death and epilepsy, that when the PGES happened, so, so here's the seizure, here's the PGES, then the breathing stops, then later the person's heart stops. So that's the progression of what kills people with these events. Now, separate from our work, it was shown by um, these researchers a long time ago that, that were interested in looking at asymmetric electrodermal activity, which happened in a lot of kids with learning disabilities, that when they stimulated the right amygdala, and here they were measuring on the palm, uh, they got a big right skin conductance response, and almost none on the left. And when they went in, and these were stimulating in the brains, inside the brains of epilepsy patients. When they stimulated the left amygdala, they got a big left skin conductance response and very little on the right. So this suggests that if a seizure or something else stimulates either amygdala, not only could it possibly take your breathing away, but it could show us a lateralized response. Um, so it's possible that something like this could explain why that first seizure that we saw had a big response on one side and not the other. Now, separately, since most of you are hearing about SUDEP for the first time, I'll just tell you a couple more things about it. In the United States, it takes more lives every year than house fires. Again, this is death after a seizure, usually after a seizure, or death in a person with epilepsy uh, that is not explained by drowning or hitting their head or a car accident or anything like that. Um, there's one every seven to nine minutes, and it has also been established in a number of studies published in the literature that SUDEP happens much less frequently if somebody is there. 
what happens when somebody's there. First thing they do when they see you having a seizure is they stimulate you, which could be one thing that could help restore the breathing, because it's also observed uh, that it's the breathing is what goes first. Um, so while we were working on all this stress stuff, we realized, uh-oh, we seem to have accidentally found something here that might relate to a very uh, dangerous condition. And if we could get people there, that might be able to, just simply stimulating people might be able to help save lives. Uh, just in case you uh, are wondering why you never heard of it, I don't know why doctors have not wanted to tell people about this for a long time, because they thought nothing could be done. But now they're finding out there are things that could be done. So you'll be hearing more about this in the future. Vertical axis is years of potential life loss, so that's deaths times um, remaining life expectancy. And SUDEP is number two after stroke among neurological uh, diseases here. Um, so more than uh, Luke Eric's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and meningitis, encephalitis, some others. Uh, so if you take away anything today, um, please take away this knowledge that you could, by helping spread the word about SUDEP, uh, there are things people can do today to prevent it, take their meds, make sure somebody's there. And by helping people know about that, um, we believe this bar could be driven way down. So as we started to learn about this, we thought, okay, we've built all these things for our research. We need to get them out of the lab. Uh, so we pivoted from all of our work on uh, autism and stress at the time to epilepsy monitoring units. And this uh, was commercialized by Empatica as the Embrace smartwatch, which uh, is shown here. And now it's out there. A lot of people are using it. And I'm getting emails that take my breath away, uh, like this one. This was from one of our early testers who said she was in the shower that morning uh, and her phone on the counter went off and said her daughter needs her help. And she goes running out of the shower to her daughter's bedroom, finds her daughter face down in bed, uh, blue, she said, not breathing, flips her daughter over and her daughter takes a breath uh, and another breath and soon turns pink again and is fine. And uh, she uh, wanted to mail me pictures of <laughs> her daughter all day. I'm kind of panicking, like, oh, no, you know, don't, don't trust any technology, right? You know, the Bluetooth connection could break, the battery could, you know, there are all kinds of things that could go wrong. She goes, it's okay. I know no technology is perfect, uh, but I think this just saved Natasha's life. And she wants everybody to, to know this is Natasha. She gave permission for her, her name. So we have now learned that getting somebody there after a seizure is very important. There's lots of news about this. Uh, actually, the um, deaths are not peaking during um, infants, uh, during childhood. They're peaking kind of people in their 30s and 40s. Uh, and the peak starts at about college age as people go off to school when people are sleeping alone. So I just want to pause for a moment again, all of us as human beings, there's a lot we can do with AI, but this problem cannot be solved by AI. We need AI and people to come together uh, to, to be there. And um, so today the AI can help us detect something and do an alert. Um, but I hope you'll leave here today and get to know your neighbor and anybody who sleeps and lives alone if they um, have this condition, which unfortunately is still way too stigmatized. We've got to get rid of that stigma, talk about it, um, and simply being there could help save a life. All right, and now this is FDA approved. Uh, so back to some of the things that I want to use to weave this uh, back into psychiatry here. We were trying to measure uh, stress. We originally thought, oh, there's just the sweat response, and this is just maybe an arousal component of emotion. Um, we've now been learning there's more specific mappings. And as I was saying to a, a group of doctors once, as, as an engineer here, probably the only one in this room, uh, like, isn't this bizarre? I mean, think about this. Why is something going on deep in the brain, okay, that when we put on scalp EEG, uh, it shows nothing, okay? Scalp EEG looks like you're brain dead. Um, and yet we're getting a whopper of response on the wrist. How bizarre is this, right? Uh, I would have never predicted this. I'm really glad I had tenure at MIT when I started <laughs> finding this, because I don't think I would have taken it seriously. Or anybody would take this seriously. Um, and this one doctor raises her hand. She goes, oh, Ross, it's easy. It's Medicine 101. 
What's that? I mean, everybody here said that, but not me. Uh, she said, you know, when we were all embryos, uh, you know, the mesoderm, we had the three kinds of tissue, right? You know the mesoderm formed the muscle and bone, endoderm, all this, these soft organs. But the ectoderm from the beginning knit together our largest organ, the skin, with our spinal cord, our neuronal system, our brain. So maybe it's not so crazy that something going on deep in the brain that the EEG can't even see is being mapped somewhere on the skin to patterns that are consistent and reliable. I've been showing you individual data, but the um, stuff we've been finding is working across populations here. Back to the Mangina Bourgeois Mangina work, again, not our labs, but others. They showed that not only when they stimulated the left and right amygdala did it show these differential Palmer responses, uh, but it was also true for direct stimulation in the brain of the anterior and posterior hippocampus, uh, anterior cingulate, um, and left and right cingulate gyrus. It was not true, however, for the cortical signal, and mid-T2, which is interesting, because there was a lot of literature for a while, about a decade, of is EDA lateralized, but it was almost all cortical studies. And it essentially was inconclusive, which you would expect to see from these direct stimulation studies. You know, maybe a random number of them got a, got a result, so not likely to, to replicate. However, these subcortical, um, these uh, limbic temporal lobe regions are showing these strong responses. So now in our studies, instead of just um, throwing away one side, we are starting to look at both sides. And so for those of you who are interested in things like the fear and threat um, and challenge and other responses, it's quite interesting now to look at this in two sides and look at when a child comes into a potentially threatening situation, are they more asymmetric um, or not? And is their dominant hand side significantly higher? We would expect the right side to go much higher in a strong right-hander with this threat challenge kind of um, anxiety or stress. Now, it's not the case that this is a simple positive-negative detector, and I can go into that much more uh, if you wish, but this is not the elusive one side is positive, one side is negative. It um, appears to be that the non-dominant side is getting a mix. Uh, However, it did cause us to go back and look at studies we'd done where we'd thrown away one side. And here's an example of a classic study that's used to elicit stress, right? The counting backwards by sevens task. Um, alone, it increases your cognitive load, and so we expect your electrodermal response to go up. Uh, we added a social component. So we had a person sitting behind you while you're doing the task and watching you, judging you, which for some of us was much more stressful. And furthermore, they would hit this obnoxious buzzer when you made a mistake. So, you know, it really, like, here's what it's going to sound like when you get it wrong. You know? And so it makes my palms sweat just thinking about it. Um, so as we see here, uh, this is um, microsemen skin conductance. Higher would correspond to sweatier uh, wrists in this case. And this is the non-dominant side, which is what people usually do, because usually in an experiment, the dominant hand is doing the task. Uh, here, both hands were not doing any tasks, they're just sitting there. But we threw away the other side thinking, you know, it's just always the same, right? Uh, and these people would be in the study as fairly stressed, and these people would be seen, especially these over here, would be seen as fairly calm. So I said, you know, given there was a person behind them, and this wasn't just cognitive load, there was some social threat component, I wonder, you know, I, I would expect the right side would not look like the left side in this case. I would expect the right side would be bigger. Let's go back and see if that's the case. And so I'm going to show you each person's right side uh, average value compared to their left side. The right is in red here. Wow. For some people, it's the same, but for these people who would have been you know, who would be contributing to EDA is indicating they were not stressed, we're actually seeing the exact opposite conclusion here. Uh, this was one cohort, we went back and looked at, we had five cohorts, and this was found across all of them. So, if you have used, which a lot of you have, electrodermal activity in the past, you've probably followed the rules of 100 years of stuff in the literature saying just, you know, it's this general arousal response, measure it on the palm, measure it on the non-dominant side to minimize motion artifacts. Uh, I 
think there may be some confounds in that literature now. Uh, and maybe some of the reasons why some of the studies have been very inconclusive is because we've had this, this um, unilateral thinking about this as one kind of arousal uh, instead of as multiple kinds of arousal. Here is an example of if you just measure the data continuously left and right for an individual and look at things going on in their day. Here I've highlighted two meetings for this person. One of the meetings is with teammates. Uh, the right is shown in red here, higher skin conductance. We used to just think of this as higher general arousal, but now we're thinking of it more specifically. And it's going up a little bit more in what was indeed a bit of a more threatening situation at the start of this meeting. And slightly high stakes situation, got to get in the car and go to another very high stakes meeting where um, in fact we find uh, the right going way up above the left. And then the meeting ends and the two sides go back to looking like each other, which is how they usually look in lab studies. Because usually in lab studies, there's no high stakes, personally significant anything going on. So if you compare the two sides, they look the same. So it makes sense that most of the literature shows that they're just the same. Um, until it's a kid with disabilities going in to be reevaluated and they feel it's a high stakes situation. And then we expect to see if they're taking it that way that they're right and they go by the left. I've also been watching this recently in um, some sports competitions when the person's doing well versus they start their opponent starts taking points on them. And similarly, we see this right side going way up above the left. Very interesting how that could possibly be. Um, can't definitively prove it until we have the concurrent measurements, um, but quite possibly more of that right amygdala response contributing significantly to that. We have to be careful, though, because movement and motor cortex contributes to it too. So we do have to look, and here we're doing that, at the activity of both hands and the temperature of both sides, uh, two other things that can influence it. And those don't explain what we see here in this case. All right, uh, let's... Um, oh, there's a paper that was published in a motion review going through a lot more of the arguments for why we now think arousal is not this unitary construct, but has multiple components, and some, some of which may be given rise to from these different regions of the brain. So instead of just thinking of sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, general arousal, I think we now need to think of ectoderm and the brain and different regions mapping to different patches of the skin and, and affecting the local sweat response in different ways that can be very interesting. And if, you, if any of you interact with dermatologists, they'll be thrilled because <laughs> they know there's all this neurological mapping, right? Different conditions that can give rise to eczema or different skin conditions in different patches. Uh, and now we're starting to realize there could be psychiatrically interesting um, measures of interest to our emotion and stress studies as well for this. Now the challenge, of course, is what does it mean in these different places that we're measuring? So what we're doing now is just being very careful to keep records of uh, where we measure. And we're also beginning some studies with neurologists who do invasive uh, surgeries where they're implanting electrodes. And we can read out concurrently different patches of uh, physiological measurement with these different brain region activations and see uh, if we can find these systematic mappings that could inform greater uh, specificity in our psychophysiology studies. All right, I'm going to shift gears again and move now into some of the more psychology and psychiatry relevant uh, stuff. So again, we started with stress and emotion. Um, found this neurological stuff that now has turned out to actually make us think differently about how we're measuring with our physiology. And before we did the work in uh, epilepsy, my boss at the Media Lab, who runs a lab of a very diverse group of people, you know, we have, we have artists and neuroscientists and electrical engineers and all these crazy nuts working together. Um, and he says to me, back when I was just building all these math models and teaching the first machine learning courses at MIT, uh, he says, Roz, when are you gonna do something actually useful uh, when are you gonna, I'm like, what is it, Walter? He says, when are you gonna build me the mood ring that tells me my wife's mood before I go home? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, come on. Like, you know, you guys know, mood ring was a stupid temperature sensor. It just changed colors. It was a fad. It probably made some people a whole lot of money. You know, yeah, maybe if I just wanted to make money and pay for my research the easy way, that, that might not be a bad idea, right? <laughs> Stop having to write all these grants. Um, so I really, 
dismissed it, but I've come back to it now. Uh, now, at MIT, we don't want to just build a stupid little um, gadget. We want to build things that are hard, that are important, that change lives, improve lives, and, you know, that do great science. So I started learning more about uh, the challenges in mood these days. I don't have to tell you guys how important this is. You know this, and sorry, this is my most depressing slide. Uh, what you may not know is that when you chomp the numbers, depression is on track to be the number one disease burden, more than cancer uh, in terms of um, disability and lives lost, more than accidents, war, and stroke uh, by the year 2030, if it continues on the trend it is. And my understanding is that it has already hit the mark as being number one in terms of years lived with disability. Uh, I see heads nodding. So, and these are not just blips that cause these trends. Uh, here the CDC data was over a 15-year period, and I understand their update is showing an even faster rate than I originally reported here. I think it's up to 30% now. So you are really the experts on why this is happening and, and what to do about it. I'm just thinking, uh, well, we had, we had some, as they did at Stanford and everybody's heard all the suicides, we had a number of tragedies at MIT also several years ago. And as I was talking to mental health experts, I said at one point to one of the experts um, at Harvard Med School who uh, does all this brain imaging, he knows the CBT, the DBT, the, um, the drugs to take, like he's just sort of an expert in everything, running these nationwide uh, treatment innovation uh, meetings. And I said to him, do we just need to get people to you faster? Like if we just got people to the experts in this room faster, you could fix this, right? Uh, and he said, he said, no, we don't know how to fix this. And I thought, you don't know how to fix this? Uh, and it, with our MIT engineering arrogance, I said, well, maybe we need to work together on this. Maybe we need engineers to come in and get data and start to help with this. Because, and some of you have seen this kind of diagram in a different context. Um, and this is the one graph I'm showing that's not, not real data in my talk. This is just a concept diagram. We, we take about... Uh, some cases more than 400 measures and we roll it up into kind of are you doing well or are you not doing well? And I imagine when UCSF hired you, you thought, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. You know, you're doing great. You're doing, you're at the top of this peak. Here's time. You come in and you do even better, right? Great fit, awesome place to be. Um, now, over time, uh, even in the very top companies out here in the Bay Area, their CEOs have been telling us that their number one problem is depression. And they are having huge numbers of people take this dive. Uh, now, hopefully they're getting good health care, certainly if they're coming here, as they take this dive and pushing back up. Um, some people, though, hit those major stressors and bounce back in their resilience. Our question as engineers, since you guys are all working over here, our question is, what could we detect over here? Could is it possible that we could see if somebody's on the red line or the blue line before they actually exhibit the outward signs that they need to come uh, and get a diagnosis? So we have been working with hundreds of measures to try to figure out if we can do this, with the thought being that if you could catch it early, maybe we could actually, and we would need your help with this, actually prevent more of this, because people say it's easier to treat when it's early. Now, right now, our partnerships working on this um, include experts like Matt Nock at Harvard Med School, uh, at Harvard with um, his expertise on suicide, working with patients who are really at the bottom of this graph. And we have a bunch of studies going on there. I won't go into those right now. I'm not going to take time to go into the ones in the middle either, except to mention that uh, you know we're working with people who are just diagnosed, um, already um, been failing multiple treatments, and people who are suicidal and being released from the hospital, lots of range. And the people who are just diagnosed, we're looking at Hamilton Depression Rating Scale scores given by Mass General Hospital physicians, psychiatrists. Uh, here's the HDRS. Uh, that the doctor gave. Here is a prediction using uh, 
no medical record data, using only data that we are measuring from the smartphone and a wearable sensor to uh, estimate the HDRS score. And it's already uh, greater than 0.8 in uh, correlation with the doctor ratings. Um, with an average root mean, with a root mean squared error of about four points on the HDRS. Um, this is published. As we dig into what it is in those features that are giving the best prediction here, we're finding greater sleep irregularity. Um, consistently in our studies, we're finding that not so much how long you sleep, but how regular your bedtime and wake time, how correlated your sleep is from day to day, is associated with uh, better health. Now, all the findings right now are still correlations. Um, we haven't done causal trials. There is a, uh, an RCT happening now, though. We are also finding, um, indeed, uh, more asymmetry in the EDA and um, reduced physical activity uh, and differences in social interaction, in some cases in GPS movement too. So our challenge going forward, and we're super interested to partner with experts like you, is how to, how to push it back, how to do more on the front end of this. While we're detecting sleep getting more and more irregular, while we're detecting you know, more and more perhaps episodes of anxiety and stress during the day um, while we're detecting maybe declines in activity and social interaction. What could we be doing before a person is actually in need of a diagnosis to maybe prevent them from continuing down that path? Uh, so we are measuring a ton of stuff. Uh, you know, the sleep-wake patterns, the light cycles, the physical activity, um, the autonomic stress measures, the texting behavior, um, the times of these behaviors, your social interaction through the phone, which is limited, uh, stuff about your social network. We're enrolling not just you, but your closest friends and people um, beyond in the study to look at the, how we influence each other and GPS patterns. Lots of data, lots of machine learning. And while I showed you before the estimate of the HDRS now, what we're trying to do is forecast um, where you're going on that curve. Are you going up or down? Is tomorrow night's mood gonna be um, on the high end of the scale positive or on the low end of the scale negative? Is tomorrow night's stress gonna be high or low? Is tomorrow night's health, just physical health, because we believe that interacts with it, likely to be healthy or unhealthy? Uh, also interested in the way the sympathetic nervous response is involved in uh, cytokine release and immune system functioning. So as we look at this, and this is not a machine learning audience, but I'm happy to answer questions about that too if you're interested. Uh, we started to build models that trained on large groups of college students and then attuned on some individuals. A little bit of data from you. And then of course you have to hold out data completely from the model for testing, uh, which we do. Um, we set up this problem to be 50-50 if it was random, and then we ask how good is it at predicting tomorrow night's high-low mood, high-low stress, um, healthy, unhealthy state. Oversimplified, cutting out the middle, um, initial binary decision. Uh, so 50 is random, and we're already at 78 to 87% accuracy forecasting tomorrow night's state. Um, and that's just using a little bit of data from now. Uh, and we're finding the models improving with more data. It's also doing a little bit of personalization. We're also finding we can do it in a more general way now. Um, this particular piece is already published. Um, we're also now trying to figure out, okay, let's say, uh, let's say this is an app in the future that says not just my weather forecast for tomorrow, but my emotional weather forecast for tomorrow. Um, okay, Roz, given your schedule, we predict higher stress tomorrow, worse mood, your health dropping, I'm not gonna be like, great, I hate this app, <laughs> you wanna know, right? Um, that's not gonna work, right? We need to help people know what to do. Um, we need your expertise to help people know what to do. And right now, the best we engineers can do, um, and this isn't causal, um, it's just correlation. We go through and we can measure features that in your past are associated with better outcomes. We also find that there's no one size fits all set of features. There's a lot of individual variation. When we cluster people, here's vertical four different clusters of people that popped out of this particular method. Uh, we see that we would give them different advice. We see, for example, that 
this cluster of people has more bright yellow, which means a higher weight that they're going to be happy tomorrow um, if they get more of the social interaction um, at night when students are, this is all limited to New England college students right now. Um, whereas this cluster of people is, is really dark here, which means that's the exact wrong advice to give them uh, the night before. So we kind of find what we might expect, right? That what works for some people is maybe the worst thing to do for some, some other people. Um, we're getting this uh, objective data. So the thought is in the future this app, instead of just giving you this depressing forecast, could give you um, maybe some things to do. But of course, how good are people at behaving and <laughs> doing what we tell them to do? That's a super hard problem. So this is a really hard challenge. Uh, all right, I want to move to Q&A, so I'm just going to wrap up here. Quick last slide. I started with stories of our work in autism, where we were judging people based on outward appearance and realizing we were often wrong. Uh, in particular, anxiety and stress can be really huge inside people, even though we don't show it outwardly. We started looking at measures of sympathetic nervous system response, in particular electrodermal activity. Here measured a skin conductance, so higher was more conductive, potentially more stressed, thought in a general arousal way. Um, to our surprise, we found the biggest peaks during non-REM sleep. That's still an area of investigation. We're doing some work with memory formation there. Uh, we built the um, first wrist wearables that could collect this data 24-7. Uh, we accidentally found generalized tonic-clonic gram mal seizures and that the size of the response we were measuring there was related to post dictal generalized EEG suppression, which is a biomarker for SUDA, so not expected in epilepsy. It takes a life every seven to nine minutes. Uh, so we uh, pivoted and um, spun out the ability to get that out there, hopefully summoning people to come uh, and stimulate a person and check on them and make sure that they're okay after a seizure. Uh, this has led us to partner with a lot of neurologists where we're now um, trying to understand more of what is causing what is causing the ability for the brain to look like it's shutting down while uh, skin conductance is going through the roof? Uh, several regions can be doing that, especially amygdala and hippocampus. Amygdala in particular, super interested in for uh, stress, anxiety, threat, and um, hippocampus also for uh, emotion and memory formation. The mappings do not take away that it's a simple left side of the body, right side of the body thing. If you walk away saying that, that, that I've been misunderstood. It's more complex. There are some regions of the brain that map bilaterally, some regions that map contralaterally, like motor, and some regions that map ipsilaterally, like, a, like amygdala and these temporal lobe regions seem to do. So we need to work out more of those, these ectoderm mappings. In the meantime, uh, trying to finally do something useful for the real world, and back to, um, since depression is on track, to, it's already such a huge problem. Um, we're trying to figure out if we can do something about it early. Can we start to detect anything behaviorally early here that means that you're more likely on the red line than on the blue line? We're trying to find that separation. Um, and to do that and to actually not just give people the alerts, but to bring the help and to build this into tools that really do uh, help prevent depression and help improve lives, we in the technology dearly need the expertise in this room. So, um, thank you for taking time to learn about this, and I really welcome um, further conversations with you. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy. Um, great talk, and thank you so much for being here. So, um, for five decades, psychophysiologists have had this love-hate relationship with skin conductance, right? They mm -hmm. love it because it's sensitive, it moves to everything, so you have lots of variability, but they hated it because it's lacked specificity. Right. So what you showed today was this beautiful specificity with both amplitude and duration and asymmetry. Yeah. So two questions. One, um, how are you going forward to increase specificity? So I can imagine using another physiologic signal like heart rate variability. Yes. Are there other features or dynamics of the signal that tell us like anticipation of recovery that could help differentiate psychological states? So how are you going forward? And my second question, just uh -huh. I want to make sure I get it in, is if you could talk a little bit about false alarms. Yes. So we learn a lot about patterns when we're wrong. So if we see one physiologic pattern, then we go backwards and we say, actually, we were wrong. That person isn't feeling that psychological state in this pattern. So I'm especially curious about false alarms. Um, 
before what you think are seizures that turn out not to be seizures? Yes, thank you. Great, great questions. Um, so we are making progress on the specificity, um, but I, I'm a bit skeptical that we're going to find just a simple value or something that is going to give you perfect specificity for this huge range of conditions. In fact, I can, I can fool myself by um, give you some cases where it really looks like something else and it's not. So I don't think EDA solo is going to give us all that specificity that we seek. However, exactly as you say, when we combine it with other signals, we get much more specificity. So in all of our emotion state recognition work, which I didn't go into here, uh, we have used multiple signals. And even in the seizure detection, we're using the motion and the skin conductance, in some cases the temperature. Uh, and also, I didn't put this here either, but with the sensitive accelerometers that are in your phones and smartwatches right now, like, like the ones that are in both of these, when and if I hold still, uh, it can pick up my heart rate and respiration. Also, we published recent case study in neurology picking that up actually in a, in a suit up case where people didn't know to get there. Um, so it recorded the respiration uh, coming to an end. The, um, so the specificity continues to need more. Now, there are cases where we can read a bit more out of the EDA, but Usually that's in a limited context. So the specificity is enhanced by knowing that there's just this context. Uh, right. um, so that's specificity. False alarm. False alarm is huge. Uh, in a longer talk on the seizure detection, I would go through lots of different tests we've done with different false alarm rates. Uh, very important that we, as, as all of you may know, if you say something, if you make the probability of detection say there's a, there's a seizure every instant, you will get perfect detection, right? You won't miss any of them, but you'll annoy the heck out of everybody because it's firing all the time pretty soon. They'll cry wolf and they'll ignore it. So you want to drive up the problem of detection and drive down the false alarm rate simultaneously. This is in um, machine learning. We talk about a receiver operating characteristic, probability of detection, false alarm rate. And so we want uh, low false alarm rate. We have worked hard on reducing the false alarm rates. Um, I see different numbers almost every week as we get, get more and more data. Uh, I believe what's published is less than one on average every couple of days. We've done better than that recently. Now, the things that cause false alarms, as you can imagine, are things that make you shake and sweat. And there are things that do that, right? Um, riding a bicycle on bad Boston roads uh, is one example. Being in a hot cab going down bumpy roads is another. Um, so we've been, as we've been collecting more and more data, like with this system, you can go to the phone, which is an e-diary, and logging everything, and you can mark when something's a false alarm. You can also cancel a false alarm. Labeled data goes back into the machine learning system, where the machine learning gets better. So right now, I believe um, Empedic has a significantly lower false alarm rate than any of the other uh, devices out there, um, and a lot of other things we've been trying to do too. But there are still false alarms. Yes, in back. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're digging into it now. We've been working on not just the binary forecasting, but a regression based forecasting. We've just published some of that. It's about an error of sort of 12 to 14 points off of a zero to 100 scale there where people are. Um, and uh, we're digging into it more. One of the problems I think is just self-report is the gold standard for are they, what's their stress score? And I, I mean, people in this room are probably very good at knowing how you're feeling. The people I work with are largely alexithymic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many of my colleagues, like, emotion, like, I don't, Ross, like, what, what do you mean? I mean, I know when somebody really, like, blows up, it's, it's like, I, I think of, yeah, exactly, it's bimodal. It's like, okay, if here's, say, a low value and a high value, like, for real, and then here's how people perceive it, ideally it would be like a line, right? When it's low, you perceive it low, when it's high, you perceive it high. Most people I work with seem to be, like, flat for this big range. And then at the end, they get it, right? And we tested this in one where we had taught them like what this means and, okay, we're gonna blind you to your data, we're gonna ask you about reporting this activation stress autonomic arousal. Uh, 
And most people were, were pretty good at that, except our people who scored high on lexithymia. With the exception of two outliers who were high on lexithymia and were actually really good at pegging their state. And so we dug in, like, why are they so good at this? Um, and we asked them, and they said, oh, well, for me, it's easy, because I'm either on one extreme or the other. And sure enough, when we went in their data, they were the extreme values, so they pegged them. Uh, but we have a problem with self-report on a lot of these stress and mood scales. We've even seen people go in for hospitalization for depression, and right before that, they're saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And their roommate is like, you're not fine, you're not fine, you're not fine. <laughs> and then they, um, they go into the hospital, and they realize, you know, you know, one was telling me I was practically catatonic before my roommate dragged me in. And we are so hardworking and oblivious to our internal state that we just don't get self-report data that is accurate. So we really need to figure out better ways to, to close that gap. I don't know how we're doing for time. I know some people have to leave right at 8.30. I'm around afterwards, too, and happy to take more questionnaires and questions. Good idea. That would be very interesting to look at. I, I would make some specific predictions, um, get very specific about what we would expect to see there. We, we have to do a lot more than just looking at the level. We get other things around it and look for specific circumstances where we expect uh, this asymmetry to happen. All right, we've got to keep into our time frame. Thanks, Dr. Thank you.